If evolution is largely about survival and reproduction, then birth and death are essential elements of that. Fortunately, the skeleton provides us some evidence about birth and death that allows us to ask questions about birth and death in the fossil record. The starting point again is thinking about comparisons between primate and human birth and death. And let's focus on birth first. Human birth, as we all know, is very difficult. The difficulty of human birth comes in part from the fact that we birth babies with large heads. In order to grow our giant brains that we need as adults, we need to give birth to babies that have sufficiently large brains as well. So babies are born with large brains. They're also born with relatively broad shoulders. Part of the constraints of birth is not just head size, but also shoulder breadth. Coupled with that is the fact that our morphology, specifically the morphology associated with bipedality in our constrained pelvis, have created a birth inlet and outlet that is quite constricted. This makes again the fit between infant head size and shoulder girth and the human pelvis very narrow and tight, meaning that oftentimes humans need assistance during birth. Giving birth individually for humans is very difficult and associated with high rates of morbidity and mortality. So traditionally practices of birth almost always involve the assistance of others. This is maybe an underappreciated fact, but it's an important form of human social cooperation associated with that fundamental element of human reproduction. If we look at primates, primate birth is far less constrained. Infant head size at birth is smaller. The pelvis also is much broader and open and more easily passed through in the context of birth. So primate birth is not nearly as constrained or as difficult as human birth. One argument about Australopithecines is that the morphological change associated with bipedality, specifically the rearrangement of the pelvis, the constriction of the pelvis, leads to difficult birth already in Australopithecines. Australopithecine of brain size as adults is not nearly that of humans, but brain size at birth is still relatively large, specifically compared to the size of the Australopithecine pelvis. Recall that Lucy's pelvis is very small. Lucy, we think, actually gave birth to at least one child during her life. Changes in the curvature of Lucy's lumbar spine, basically an increased curvature associated with carrying the weight of a pregnancy out in front of you and reorienting the, your center of gravity associated with that, seem to suggest to researchers that Lucy gave birth in her life. So this tiny pelvis and the associated small pelvic canal associated with it gave birth and allowed for the passage of an infant. So it's possible that Australopithecines already had constrained birth. Karen Rosenberg has argued prominently that Australopithecines actually required the same kind of assisted birth that humans do. In other words, that practices of midwifery go back all the way to the Australopithecine record. This is important because it's not just an argument about birth, and it's not just an argument about morphology, but an argument about social cooperation in the Australopithecines. One of the things we eventually see in the human record is immense social cooperation. So understanding what kind of behaviors led to that cooperation is critical. Historically, in the historically male-dominated field of paleoanthropology, male activities, specifically hunting kinds of activities, have been argued to be essential components of the evolution of human cooperation. Rosenberg has argued that birth, a far more important evolutionary trait than hunting, and one that appears perhaps earlier in the fossil record, is more associated or more likely associated with the evolution of cooperation, and that this earliest cooperation would have been likely female-female cooperation as opposed to male-male cooperation. And this cooperation again is associated with the reality of trying to fit a fairly large infant head size, one associated with beginning expansion of brain size, through a constrained pelvis, a pelvis associated with obligate bipedality that this reality of constraint led to the necessity of cooperation. Now others have argued that perhaps birth in Australopithecines was not as constrained as we see in humans today. Again, because brain size was not as large. And in fact, the timing of birth has less to do perhaps with the constraints of the size of the pelvis and more to do with the energetic demands that birth placed on a female. That birth comes about not when the head size is reaching its maximum size allowed to pass through the pelvis, but rather that birth comes about when the energetic demands of the infant begin to exceed the energetic capabilities of the mother. Carrying a pregnancy to term is a very energetically costly activity, and it's not always the case that the evolutionary interests of the mother are the same as the evolutionary interests of the offspring. You don't have to be a new parent to understand that the evolutionary interests of parent and offspring are not always aligned. The offspring wants as many resources as it can from its parent, while the parent should only be giving as much resources as are evolutionary advantageous for it to give. It doesn't want to invest too heavily in any one offspring, knowing that that might disadvantage its likelihood of having future offspring. This is most prominently expressed when we think about the maternal-offspring conflict associated with birth. So while the infant 
that developing fetus in a woman might want as much energy from the mother as possible, might want to remain safe in the womb and continue growing as much as possible, there's limits, not just constrained by the pelvis and its dimensions, but also by the maternal energetic capacity, how much energy a mother actually has available to give to that growing offspring. At a certain point, there's an intersection where simply the mother can't produce enough energy to feed that growing fetus, and it's time to get the fetus out of its body. So it turns out that the energetic constraints associated with bringing a pregnancy to term, as well as the obstetric constraints associated with morphology of a pelvis that's designed for bipedality, work together to lead to birth occurring at a certain time. These factors work together to create a certain pattern of birth in humans. And it's possible, indeed an intriguing argument, that already in all strepithecines, the redesigned pelvis led to constraints associated with birth, and a more difficult birth than we see in apes, and certainly one that was associated with increased cooperative behavior, especially amongst females. This remains an important source or important way of thinking about the evolution of social behavior in the all